<laughs> Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is our last session in the ASCII conference, uh, and it is the student session. This is a very important session, I think, we all think, uh, which was started some years ago by Enrique Pumar. Uh, Pumar has a lot of vision. He is now professor of sociology and chair of the Department of Sociology at Santa Clara University in California. And he was formerly at Catholic University in Washington, DC. Uh, I, Pumar is with us today, which is very nice. Uh, today's chair for this conference and the one that has done all the work on this year's papers, which was a lot of work because we fortunately had a lot of students who submitted papers, which was very, very nice. And that is Mario Gonzalez Corso. Mario is, of course, here with us. So I will introduce Mario to you and then Mario will introduce the students. I do want you to notice that in the questions and answers, where you can always send us questions and answers, if you go into more dot, 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 Q and A, uh, and that there we have put the information on where you can get all the papers and the PowerPoints that we have so far that have been presented at this conference, okay? And this is the website of the Coalition for Peace and Ethics. Uh, that is Larry Katabaker's, um, website and that's where he has put all the participants shared papers and powerpoints for the ASCII conference so those are available to everybody okay so let me introduce mario mario is associate professor in the department of economics and business at lehman college of the city university of new york better known as cuny there he teaches graduate and undergraduate courses in economics and finance Mario Gonzalez Corso is also a faculty fellow of the Cuba project of the Biltner Center. This was a Cuba project that was started by Mauricio Font, uh, who has also participated with us in ASCII for many years. Uh, and it's part of the Biltner Center for Western Hemisphere Studies in the Graduate Center of CUNY. Mario was a contributing editor for the section on the Cuban economy of the Handbook of Latin American Studies, published by the Library of Congress. His research and publications focus on economic reforms in transition economies, with a particular emphasis on Cuban agriculture, banking, and the emerging non-state sector. He also monitors financial sector employment trends and entrepreneurship, with a focus on transition and post-socialist economies. Mario. Thank you, Sylvia, very much. And I'd like to welcome everyone to our wonderful student panel. I have prepared a very brief um, PowerPoint that I want to share with you as I introduce the panel and as, I, as we navigate through this. So the ASCII student panel um, what I really want to do is just take a couple of minutes and provide some background and history about the panel. I've been doing some homework uh, in, pre in preparation for this uh, session. And so the ASCII student competition, as everybody here knows, is formerly known as the Jorge Perez Lopez Student Prize. I know that in my literature, in my emails, it, for the sake of brevity, I refer to it often as the ASCII student competition or the ASCII student prize. But I want to recognize the fact that it, it's, it's officially known as the Jorge Perez Lopez student prize and that is really in honor of Jorge Perez Lopez who is one of the most respected and admired members of, of the association. He's uh, played a pivotal role as everybody here knows and I'm, I'm very happy to uh, recognize the fact that we are every time we, we every year we have the student competition really Jorge plays a critical role and it is an honor uh, to share this competition that carries his name. I also want to um, mentioned something that Sylvia already mentioned, which is that for more than 20 years under the chairmanship of and Professor Enrique Pumar, who is here with us, who, who was uh, agreeable to serve as a discussant and who served uh, for so many years as a chair of this panel, you know, the student, uh, the ASCII um, student prize competition has really emerged as a venue for young scholars like the ones that we'll be presenting here today to present their Cuba related research. Um, I looked back at some data and I found that more than 50 plus papers have been presented in this panel since the early 2000s. 
I have to confess, I should have gone back to 1990 to the founding of ASCII because by the way, this is the 30th year that since the founding of ASCII. Um, and so, but since the early 2000s, 50 plus papers have been presented in the student panel. And in fact, we have not just anecdotal evidence, but actual evidence showing that uh, participating in the student prize competition, either directly or indirectly has opened many doors for young uh, promising scholars um, that have have gone through the competition and they've been able to build networks and relationships and go on to really uh, important positions in academia, in think tanks and in other kinds of institutions. Uh, I'm also proud to say that many of the recipients remain active members of ASCII. So I'm hoping that the students that are participating today, and I'm going to use the, I'm, I'm also going to tell them that I'm going to be hounding them to join ASCII. Um, and uh, I'm really hopeful that many of these, that all of them who are participating today, and in, and in fact, many from, from the past will remain, will become, and will remain act active members of ASCII. Um, since 2018, I've been serving as a chair of the panel. And it's really, I, my hope is that the panel will continue to grow in the coming years, but there's one missing bullet point here uh, in, in the slide that you're seeing, and that is, I really want to thank the reviewers, the blind reviewers that, that participated this year for their work, for their contribution, for their valuable comments. Um, I do have some comments that from some of our reviewers that I will share with the students, um, but I wanted to do that after the panel. Uh, these are really useful uh, comments and the reviewers did an excellent job in turning in their, their, um, their reviews and turning in their scores and so on. And finally, before presenting the panel and opening up the, uh, obviously the panel for the presenters that we have here today, I wanted to share with you some very uh, short statistics about this year's panel. So as you can see here, we received a total Okay, we received a total of nine papers in the panel. Um, eight were graduate papers, one was an undergraduate paper, but I also wanted to show you by geographic region, we got two papers from Cuba, four were from the USA, three came from Europe. This is in the middle of a pandemic, of course. This is in the middle of an environment that, ha that, that we're facing a lot of uh, uncertainty in academia. And even under that, those circumstances we received all these papers that you're seeing here, you know, which, which I'm very proud to say that this, this is a significant number of papers. Remember, keep in mind that the topic of Cuba has, you know, it's, it's, it's a limited topic in many ways. Keep in mind that, um, you know, that again, we're going through a very uncertain environment and, uh, but I'm very happy with the results that I'm showing you here. Um, in terms of topics, we received papers about entrepreneurship, foreign investment, trade, international relations, politics, society, even one about history. And um, I wanted to close by saying that if you look at the kinds of papers that we're receiving, that we have received over the years um, for the student competition, not only has the quality continue to improve, but I'm very happy to see, I'm very pleased to see that um, students who study different fields beyond economics find ASCII as, a, as an attractive venue to submit their work. And so the student prize competition, it's really one of the, most, as uh, Sylvia mentioned before, uh, one of the most important panels uh, for, for ASCII, but not just the panel, it's also an opportunity for us to welcome young, promising scholars. And so uh, today what we have in our panel will be uh, structured as follows. The first paper will be by Adriana Vitagliano from Oxford Universities. She will present a paper on remittances and protest, the case of Cuba. That uh, presentation, Adriana's presentation will be followed by Denise Delgado from the University of Massachusetts. Uh, Denise's paper is about the, uh, the role of the Cuban diaspora in the economic and political changes in the island. And then the third paper will be a paper by Isabel, and I think I probably misspelled your name, Isabel, I, I hope not, but uh, anyway, Isabel de Sisto, she is from Harvard University. And her topic is, the title of her paper is Atoms for Autonomy and the objective is to explain the Cuban reaction 
to the Chernobyl nuclear accident. Um, we will have after the paper, so each presenter will have 15, that is one five, 15 minutes uh, to present their papers. Um, and then following the presentations, we're going to have two discussants who were kind enough to agree to join us here today. The first discussion will be Professor Enrique Pumar from Santa Clara University. So Professor Pumar will comment on the papers from Denise uh, and uh, Isabel. And then we're, the second discussant is Michael Strauss, who was also very kind uh, to agree to share his comments and he will comment on Adriana's paper. And so uh, without further to do, I would like to ask our first presenter, Adriana, to please go ahead and present your paper and uh, 15 minutes or if you can do better than that, that'll be great. So welcome Adriana, we look forward to seeing your presentation. Thank you so much. And I will just start presenting. Okay. So thank you, Mario. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you to uh, the team for the opportunity to present alongside such wonderful panelists. Uh, this presentation is based on research conducted in support of my master's dissertation at Oxford, where I recently graduated with an MSc in Latin American studies. Um, and so I'll just start with a brief outline. Essentially, uh, in this paper, I build on existing studies as well as uh, remittance micro theories to further explore how remittances might impact protest in non-democracies um, and how this may have trickle down effects on the longevity of incumbent authoritarian regimes. So to begin just with uh, a brief overview of general remittance trends, um, remittances serve a wide range of uses, the main and most popular being immediate consumption, so the purchase of basic welfare goods, um, but they can also be used as um, capital for financing small enterprises and small businesses. Um, remittances represent an increasingly crucial source of external financing for low and middle income countries. Um, and this is represented by a variety of different attributes, a few of which I'll touch on here. Um, so in terms of sheer volume, last year in 2019, remittances uh, reached a record 554 billion to LMICs. And this far outpaces both FDI and portfolio investment. So again, clearly a very important source of capital. Um, in terms of reliance, if we look at percentage of GDP, particularly in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, remittances can form up to 10% of GDP for certain nations and in Central America in certain cases up to the 30%. Um, and on top of all of this, we're seeing consistent, impressive growth trends in remittances. So again, within the region itself, um, remittances have consistently increased by between six to nine and a half percent over the past five years. And in between 2005 and 2015, um, globally remittances more than doubled. Uh, so again, as the importance increases, it's very interesting to look at the forecast um, and see that as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, remittances are for the first time in recent history projected to decrease this year. Um, and they're estimated to suffer a decline of almost up to 20% globally. Um, and that's a similar number for Latin America and the Caribbean. So given all this and given the increasing importance, um, it's unsurprising that remittances have a wide variety of economic effects as well as political and social effects. Uh, however, the majority of remittance literature is mainly focused on economic effects, both micro and macro, um, with the study of political effects really a relatively new focus of scholars. Um, and so within this growing body, there is uh, there are contradictory findings related to the relationship between remittances and democratization, as well as remittances and uh, their impact on either reinforcing or eroding the stability of authoritarian regimes. And so this is where I uh, situate my, my study is specifically looking at the impact of remittances on protest. Um, and within literature, there are two existing conflicting micro theories. The first being that remittances decrease protests through the substitution effect, which essentially refers to the dy dynamic whereby remittances increase the income of recipients 
uh, these funds are then used to purchase welfare goods, thereby relieving the government of the need to provide these welfare goods. Um, as a result, these funds can then be diverted and channeled to support the strength of the regime. Um, another point here is that remittances have been found to also have a um, mit uh, mitigating effect on dissatisfaction of citizens with their governments. Um, however, on the other hand, we have studies that have found that remittances can actually increase the um, rates of protest through the patronage effect, whereby remittances by increasing income of recipients reduce their reliance on the state. So reduce their reliance on clientelistic networks um, and as a result actually increase uh, resources needed to protest and decrease the risk or the cost associated with protest for these citizens. Um, so this is essentially to say that we still don't have a clear view of what the relationship is. Um, and one study by um, a scholar essentially identifies this social remittance effect, so a third causal mechanism, as a means of explaining these conflicting results. And the social remittance effect, um, originally identified by Peggy Levitt in the 90s, basically says as money is sent back, um, migrants how, who have absorbed, you know, perhaps norms, ideas, and principles in their host countries also send these ideas back with the money. Um, and as a result, if we look at the source of remittances, in cases where remittances are sent from non-democracies to non-democracies, we're much less likely to see any positive correlation between remittances and protest. Um, but this would not be the case when remittances are sent from democracies to autocracies. Um, and so this is where I situate my question, which is how might this apply to the case of Cuba, um, specifically with remittances sent from the US? Um, and to uh, conduct this discussion, I leverage Albert Hirschman's Exit Voice and Loyalty Framework, um, which has been used to analyze interactions between citizens and their government using political variants of the initial schema used to look at failing firms and customers. Um, and so his initial conceptualization of exit and voice categorizes them as rival actions, that as citizens pursue exit, this is at the cost of the atrophy of voice and vice versa. Um, however, these can also serve as complementary actions. And so this poses a question, when citizens are dissatisfied with their government, when might exit prevail over voice? Um, and then when might both actions be pursued simultaneously or jointly? And how might this linkage occur? Um, so that brings me to my hypothesis, which was that I expected to find as US remittances to Cuba increase that protest might as well. Uh, and then using Hirschman's framework, I suggested that US remittances to Cuba might serve as a linking mechanism for bringing exit and voice together um, to work in tandem. So in order to test this, I applied a mixed methods approach. I conducted a simple statistical analysis and then conducted a qualitative analysis using um, Hirschman's framework once again. So first I um, estimated total US remittances to Cuba over the past 30 years. Um, and I then plotted this uh, in comparison to values extrapolated from UN data on total remittances to Cuba. Um, this figure here shows both of these data points plotted against each other. You can see the curve is quite similar with the blue estimate showing more aggressive growth. Um, so Having estimated my remittance variable, I then developed a variable for measuring protest, um, which can of course be done in a variety of ways. I um, ended up referencing several different databases and developing variables based on observed indicators of protest. So um, observed demonstrations, anti-regime demonstrations in newspapers and different media sources. Um, I developed two different variables. One uh, based on the maximum reported cases and one based on the average. Um, and again, you can see here they follow a very similar um, curve in terms of the trends of frequency over time. And again, this is for the past 30 years. Um, and then I tested these variables using a simple non-parametric correlation analysis. Um, the figures here show that um, the results of this test, which was a significant relationship um, and a moderate to strong positive correlation between remittances and protest. Uh, and looking at both variables, that was the, the case. 
So these findings would suggest support for both Matum's and Escriba Fulch's initial theory that remittances and protests might be positively correlated in uh, non-democracies. Um, however, in order to look and explore the causality of this relationship a bit more, um, I return to leveraging Hirschman's framework. And what I um, propose is that while exit may have in the beginning initially undermined voice in Cuba by eliminating the population of citizens that might be uh, the most passionately dissenting or the most likely to organize politically and participate in protest, that these multiple waves of outmigration um, ultimately develop this you know, US-based diaspora and this community by providing remittances back to the island um, ultimately actually facilitated the demonstration of this dissenting voice. Um, and the way this occurred was through the means of increasing or contributing to the development of both opportunity and motivation for protest. Um, and so in this sense, remittances um, mechanize this linkage of exit and voice. So we don't see a seesaw where exit occurs at the expense of voice, and rather we see that through remittances, um, these two actions can actually work in tandem. Um, and then similarly, that because of the way that they contribute to increased opportunity motivation for protest, um, we see the patronage and social remittance effects potentially also occurring here. Um, so having said this, um, to conclude, this obviously is an area of study that could benefit from further focus, further research, um, especially in terms of design. I think that uh, there are additional elements, perhaps ethnography or um, different estimates of remittances that could be incorporated to make uh, this a bit more robust. Um, but then I'd also like to point out that given the current climate with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, this research poses uh, increasingly important topics for research as well. Um, countries that are dependent on remittances are likely to be disproportionately impacted uh, by the economic decline. Um, migrants are often the first to be impacted by economic crises. Um, and as we've seen, the industries in which they're often employed have been hit most severely in many cases, services, tourism, et cetera. Um, and yet despite this, even as remittances drop so dramatically, their importance will likely relatively continue to increase because we see that um, according to World Bank estimates, foreign direct investment as well as private portfolio investment are estimated to drop even more dramatically than remittances by over 35 and 80% respectively. So given all this, uh, basically a question I pose as perhaps of interest would be how these fluctuations and remittance flows might impact the political landscape of migrants origin countries, particularly as related to democratization in autocracies, um, specifically protest rates and frequency. So thank you very much. Thank you, Adriana. I have to um, apologize for a moment because I, I failed to introduce Adriana, I had her biographical note. Uh, so I'm gonna do it in a very unorthodox way. I'm going to introduce you now after your presentation. <laughs> so you can say, well, the host really, you know, but let me briefly um, talk about uh, Adriana and make her formal introduction here, which I think was the right thing for me to do at the time, but I won't do it for the others this bad. So bear with me. So Adriana, thank you for your presentation. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, Adriana Vitagliano, she holds an MSc in Latin American Studies from Oxford University and a BA in International Affairs and Public Policy from Princeton University around my neck of the woods. Um, <laughs> her research interests include uh, comparative political economy and entrepreneurship in Latin America. That's a big topic, entrepreneurship in Latin America all over the place, right? Uh, her previous works include her graduate dissertation, remittances and protests and reconceptualization of exit and voice in the Cuban case. From all of Latin America, she chose our little island of Cuba. So great. Um, and two undergraduate thesis, emerging entrepreneurship and foreign investment in Cuba and competing narratives of gentrification in Old Havana. Adriana is currently pursuing an MBA from Oxford University, Said School of Business as a Forte Foundation Fellow. So that was our first presenter. Now I'm going to <laughs> present our second presenter, who is Denise 
Delgado Vasquez. Uh, her the title of her presentation is The Cuban Diaspora's Participation in the Economic and Political Changes on the Island. So Denise is a public policy PhD student at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, where she's studying the Cuban diaspora's economic and political participation in processes of change in Cuban society with a particular focus on, guess what, remittances. <laughs> Denise is currently collaborating with the Latin American Migration Remittances, oops, I went too fast, and development program at the Inter-American Dialogue. And let's see and as well as International Organization of Remittances and Migration. She has, a, she has been a visiting scholar at various universities, including the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies at Harvard, the Cuban Research Institute, our dear Cuban Research Institute at Florida International University, where she was a visiting fellow last summer. Um, before that, she was a researcher affiliated with the Havana think tank CIP, CIPS, um, and she's a principal collaborator for the Cuban Capacity Building Project Cuban Horizon at Columbia Law School. Denise earned a BA in sociology from the Universidad de La Habana and a master's MA in social development from the Universidad Católica de Murcia. So it is my pleasure to now turn it over to Denise who will present, who will be presenting her paper, The Cuban Diaspora's Participation in the Economic and Political Changes on the island. Go ahead, Denise, you have thank 15 you. minutes. You're yeah, welcome. thank you very much. Let me see if I can share my screen. Okay. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for this welcoming and the introductory remarks. And uh, so I want to thank ASCII, Jorge Perez Lopez, uh, Mario Corso, Silvia Pedraza, Larry Frank, the reviewers, everyone who has considered uh, my paper for this important competition. And I also want to say that this research started last summer when I was a fellow at the, research, the Cuban Research Institute in Florida International University. So I want to also to thank Dr. Jorge Duani, uh, all the, <clears throat> the research team, as well as especially to Dr. Uh, Guillermo Grenier, who granted me access to the data collected by the Cuba Pool 2018. So thank you very much. And this presentation is about the Cuban diaspora's participation in economic and political changes on the island, even though I focus more on the economic side. And um, so um, also from the, I want to be fast in the methodological and theoretical aspects so I can go to the results, but from the methodological aspect, I followed a mixed method uh, approach where I first analyzed the uh, data collected by the Cuba pool 2018. And then I co um, combined the information I also collected from 10 in-depth interviews I conducted with uh, Cuban Americans living in South Florida. Uh, so as all we know, political and economic reasons have motivated the Cuban migration abroad. And uh, even though Cubans are spread out around the world, the US is the main country of reception. And there are different states where there is more representation of Cubans, but they are mainly based in Florida. So based on the, um, the US census from 2019, there were around a million of Cubans living in, specifically in Miami-Dade County in 2019. Um, parallel to migration, there have been some changes happening on the island. And uh, in 2011, the Cuban government relaunched the private self, um, the self enterprise, uh, private initiatives on the island. And, and before that time, there were less than 200,000 private entrepreneurs. But by September 2019, there were more than half uh, a million of Cubans who were doing private enterprises on the island. At the same time, the amount of remittances have been growing over the years. And uh, before 2011, so we can see there were like $1.9 billion arriving as uh, remittances to the island. But by 2018, there were around 3.7 billion, which is 3,700 millones de dollars. 
on remittances. So these two factors, these two events are not disconnected. They are well um, designed and documented research based on case studies that shows that um, since the relaunch of the private enterprises in Cuba, there have been Cuban Americans that were motivated to participate in this process as well, and they start sending their working capital to support the development of private enterprises on the island. Oh, sorry. And there has been also some political changes happening between the two countries in the uh, foreign relationships arena. And in 2016, former President Barack Obama traveled to Cuba, and he had a great impact not only for the foreign policy relations, but also for the Cuban people mood. So I was fortunate enough to be there in that moment. I could feel the mood of the people, how happy they were. Um, so they have like a double impact, I would say. And uh, President Barack Obama traveled to Cuba with a group of influential actors, people, Cuban Americans who wanted to support the approach between the two countries. And <clears throat> since then, uh, there were some changes happening in the Cuban economy as well. There was an increase in tourism. There were uh, a lot of cruises arriving to the Havana Bay uh, with a lot of Cuban Americans and the United States citizens. So to the fact that the U.S. become the second largest visitor to the island, which was a great uh, um, change for the Cuban economy, but also not only for the Cuban economy, but also for the people who were working up front, uh, offering their services uh, to the tourists, especially because they received tips, and tips means a lot for the Cuban economy, like for the family economy. Uh, and at the same time, there have been some changes on how the Cuban government has been approaching to the diaspora. So, this is um, to the left, this is Rodrigo Marmierka, uh, which is the Cuban Minister of Foreign Trade and Foreign Investment, who was inviting in 2019 the Cuban diaspora to participate in projects uh, with Cuba, but it was mainly for uh, to participate with the state and not with the private sector, which is something that I think is most needed to happen to formalize those channels. Um, and it was also, the Cuban diaspora was also invited to participate with their opinions for a process of public consultation for the Cuban constitution. Uh, However, as I said, they were invited to share their voice, but not their vote. And uh, for the economic participation, I'm going to take into account three variables. The first one is visit. The second one is sending remittances and the third one is investments. And uh, for the interviewers I was talking to, um, as soon as they got uh, legal residence in the United States, they got their permanent residence and they got some stable economic situation, they planned their first trip to Cuba to visit their families. And I uh, found out there were some differences between generations. So the younger people, they uh, plan their trips uh, more frequently, sometimes every three, four or five months to see their friends and family on the island, what, while uh, elder generations plans uh, their trips less frequently, but for the people I was talking to, they spend more time in Cuba. So I have one of my cases of study. She lived between the two countries and she spent half the year in Havana and the other half of the year in the United States, which is a very interesting case for me because every time she was referring home, I had to ask her what, what home means because sometimes she was talking about her home in Florida and other times she was talking about her home and family living in Cuba. Uh, according to the, the analysis of the data I made uh, of the Cuba pool 2018, around 40% of the respondents said that they were sending remittances to their family or friends in Cuba. And from then it is significant that 70% arrived to the US after 1995. And if you are familiar with the Cuba pool report, the one who was published, maybe you find some like slight differences 
compared to the numbers I'm presenting here. And I think that might be related to the sample weightening, uh, but in general, the trends are the same. From uh, the interviews I conducted, I could see that remittances play a key role for family consumption. So they have been used to solve basic needs, like things from the daily life, like food, clothing, transportation, support for health and education. One of my interviewees said in this respect that being able to send money to, he said, my family in those first months I got paid was an otherworldly thing. Not to mention the first visit I made to Cuba where I was able to pay a meal for my family and invite my friends out. Remittances have, well, these type of transactions have also worked as a working capital and have been used to the development of private enterprises. Sometimes it has been like more permanent and systematic way, other times it's something temporary. So one of my interviewees said that I am a computer engineer and sometimes I have clients I cannot attend. I ask a Cuban friend living on the island to make a web page or a web application for my client's business. They earn some extra money and I don't lose my clients. This is a way I help my friends in Cuba. And in this case, this interview, we see that type of collaboration um, across borders as a win-win relationship. Regarding the Cuba pool, uh, we can also see that um, most, like, almost half of the sample believe that U.S. citizens should be allowed to invest in Cuban business if they want. They should have that right. And uh, this is especially noticeable for the people who are younger, from 18 to 39 years old, and those who arrived after 1995. As well, 42% of these Cuban Americans um, who support investment on the island would invest in their own private company in Cuba. At the same time, uh, Florida is home of influential actors and coalitions that impact on the US foreign policies towards Cuba. And uh, my experience uh, being in Florida, talking to the people, to very diverse people has shown me a very diverse context, a space, very vibrant in terms of politics and people want to say what they think. And it has been really interesting to me to see that some actors have been trying to influence by helping connect people, by stimulating educational trips and cultural exchange. On the other hand, there are some other peoples who have been trying to limit that type of exchange. And that uh, struggle has been kind of passionate for both sides. Um, so for example, Cafe Versailles is one of the historical places where part of the Cuban diaspora who live in South Florida goes there, they gather and protest and they criticize the system operating in Cuba. And what I found really interesting during this last year studying the Cuban Americans living in South Florida is that I see there are new voices, new generations joining to those efforts and they have become local activists. They are really mediatic and I wonder to what extent they might be impa in impacting or affecting, influencing the younger generation living in South Florida. So this is something that I'm really very looking forward to see the Cuba Pool 2020, to see uh, what are the differences or how the Cuban American population in South Florida have been changing their political preferences as uh, due to the influence of both the um, the, 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 the new policies, uh, the new, the current administration foreign policies towards Cuba, but also the emergence of new local activists. And finally, beyond all these, it seems kind of general that over 80% of Cuban living in Miami-Dade County believe that embargo has not worked. And this is something even across years of arrival, migratory wave and uh, age. So 
Finally, I have some policy recommendations because I believe this research have policy implications both for Cuban policymakers and for American policymakers. So my first uh, recommendation is to formalize the diaspora's participation in the process of economic changes by establishing formal channels for them to invest their capital in the private sector in Cuba. Uh, for American policymakers to remove restrictions that prohibit or limit U.S. citizens to invest, to have the right to invest in Cuban businesses and remittances travel. For both uh, Cuban and American policymakers, I consider it's important to take new steps towards the normalization of diplomatic relations between the two countries that facilitate the Cuban diaspora participation in this process of both economic and political changes on the island, as well as for the Cuban policymakers integrate the Cuban diaspora into political process on the island, as well as it happens with other migrants in other countries in Latin America, and for Cuban policymakers to develop and implement programs for collective remittances that support communities with economic vulnerability and civil society will be in. And finally, the last recommendation is something that I didn't touch on on my presentation for the time, and we can talk about that later, is to expand the development of digital remittances technology as a way to reduce the cost of sending money uh, to the island. So those are my main ideas for my presentation. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Denise. Thank you for your presentation. Um, if you can unshare your screen, <laughs> so I can share mine. <laughs> uh, okay, here we are. So I'm going to move on and introduce our third presenter. Uh, it's, she is Isabel de Sisto. The title of her presentation is Atoms for Autonomy, Explaining the Cuban Reaction to the Chernobyl Nuclear Accident. Isabel graduated from Harvard University this May with a BA in government and an MA in regional studies, concentrating on Russia, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia. Her primary research focuses on Soviet-Cuba relations. Um, in 2018, Isabel spent a semester studying in Havana. She returned uh, to Havana, I suppose, in, in 2019 to conduct interview research for her master's thesis on Soviet Cuban student exchange programs. And this fall 2020, she will begin her master's in philosophy degree in politics, uh, in the program in politics and international studies at the University of Cambridge. So welcome, Isabel, uh, to make your presentation. We're glad you were able to join us and you have 15 minutes uh, to present. Sorry, I think you need to enable share, sh uh, screen sharing. I'm not able to share my screen. And why don't you try now? Um, let's see. Now it's working, thank you. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes. My name is Isabel, um, and you can have, you see my contact information here. I won't repeat the title of my presentation. You can read it here. Um, essentially, this research grew out of a simple term paper that I wrote for a class I took last year in the fall on Ukrainian history. Um, and I'm hoping to expand this research in the future, so I look forward to getting your comments. Um, now, you may be wondering what could Ukrainian history possibly have to do with Cuba? But I actually found this to be a very fruitful area of investigation. And my presentation explores the interesting connection between the Chernobyl nuclear disaster and nuclear power and Cuba. Okay, um, so to begin, on August 25th, 1986, there was an exchange of letters between Cuban President Fidel Castro and American Congressman Michael Bilirakis, which dominated the front page of Cuba's most popular daily newspaper, Granma. Um, Bilirakis wrote his letter just six days after the accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Soviet Ukraine. He wrote that he had learned of Cuba's plans to build its own nuclear power plant with Soviet aid. And in light of the Chernobyl accident, he urged Castro to, quote, learn from this tragic accident and take precautions against a repetition. 
Castro, of course, defended the Cuban project, asserting that, quote, no nuclear power plant in the United States has the security or the number of highly qualified engineers, technicians, and workers as ours. On the subject of Chernobyl, however, he remained silent. So now a contemporary reader, perhaps not the panelists and um, participants here who are perhaps more, more well acquainted with Cuban-Soviet relations, but someone perhaps who doesn't know might interpret Castro's silence to mean either he was unaware of the deadly consequences of Chernobyl or perhaps indifferent. Of course, neither is true. Um, the Cuban government understood very well the damage that had been unleashed by Chernobyl, but refused to halt Cuban efforts to bring nuclear power to the island. In 1990, I argue that Cuba's seemingly contradictory behavior became even more pronounced when the government launched a program to bring children from the Chernobyl disaster zone to receive medical treatment in Cuba. By offering to treat tens of thousands of Chernobyl victims, Cuba was implicitly acknowledging the devastation caused by the accident. But at the same time as the Cuban government converted the beach of Tarara into a medical complex for Soviet patients, construction on nuclear reactors near the village of Juragua steamed ahead. So paradoxically, it seems that the Chernobyl accident really had a negligible impact on Cuba's plans to build its own nuclear power plant. And so considering this question, this topic rather, I kind of came up with this research question, which is why did the Cuban government launch a massive medical aid program for the victims of Chernobyl while simultaneously building a Cuban nuclear power plant? That seems strange to me and I wanted to investigate it further. So to set the scene, let's flash forward a little bit from April 1986 when Chernobyl accident happened to June 2019 when I was in Moscow um, doing research in the Russian archives for my thesis on Soviet Cuban exchange programs. And at that time, HBO's Chernobyl miniseries came out, which many of you may have seen. I highly recommend it if you have not. And this caused some controversy in Russia as is to be expected. But what I didn't expect was that in early July, when I traveled from Moscow to Havana to interview Cubans who studied in Soviet universities, I did not expect that so many of my interviewees would bring up this Chernobyl series. They wanted to talk about it. And I was really curious as to what the connection between Cuba and Chernobyl could possibly be. And so I soon learned that Chernobyl has massive symbolic importance in Cuba because Cuba organized the largest program of medical aid to the Chernobyl victims of any country in the wake of the accident. Within Cuba, people are extremely proud of the Niños de Chernobyl program, but outside of the island in the United States and even in my Ukrainian history class, nobody had ever heard of this. Um, coincidentally, at the same time that I was in Havana and there was a debut of a photo exhibit at the Fototeca, which I went to. Um, and the exhibit was called Niños de Chernobyl, Documentos Extraviados, Children of Chernobyl Locks Documents. And what was really interesting to me was that two men, two Ukrainian men were in attendance at the opening and they had received treatment as children. So although I was conducting research on a totally different topic at that time, I was really drawn in by this story. And so when it came time to write my term paper for my history class, I decided to make that the topic of my investigation. So to give you a brief overview of the Children of Chernobyl program, in April 20, on April 26, 1986, during a routine maintenance test, a reactor exploded at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Soviet Ukraine causing the worst nuclear accident in history. Initially, Cuban reaction to the Chernobyl accident was muted. On April 29th, 1986, Granma reprinted a three sentence long announcement from the Soviet Union State News Agency, essentially saying that an accident had taken place, but that everything was fine. And in the days following that, the Cuban newspapers essentially parroted um, Soviet media, which downplayed the incident. Cuba, of course, wanted to remain a steadfast Soviet ally and also didn't want to cause alarm about its own nuclear project. Most Cubans I talked to told me that they were not aware of the scale of the accident at the time. One Cuban I interviewed was studying in Kyiv when the accident happened and Chernobyl is very close to Kyiv. He learned what had happened from his mother who called him on the phone from Cuba to ask if he was okay. But Cubans began to learn the true scale of the accident later around in 1990 when Soviet and later Ukrainian children began to arrive in droves to receive medical treatment in Cuba. 
The impetus for this program came from Anatoly, Anatoly Matvienka, the general secretary of the Ukrainian Komsomol, who expressed his, quote, worry about the state of the Ukrainian children after the accident to Cuban consul Sergio Lopez in 1989. Now, Cuba was ready to answer this call. It had already had significant experience providing medical aid to Soviet people because it had treated a small number of veterans from the Soviet war in Afghanistan and victims of the large accident rather earthquake that happened in Armenia. So in March 1990, the first group of children from Kyiv arrived in Havana. And you can see a picture here of Castro greeting them at the airport. And the program continued well beyond the fall of the USSR in 1991, through the special period, and all the way up to 2011 when it was terminated. In total, over 26,000 people were treated, 22,000 of them were children, and 86% came from Ukraine. And after 1998, Cuban doctors also treated victims of Chernobyl in Ukraine, in Kyiv and Crimea. And I've met some people who received treatment. So this program became a really important part of the bilateral relationship between Ukraine and Cuba. And you know, Ukrainian President Yanukovych gave the Cuban ambassador to Ukraine a medal um, as sort of to commemorate his contribution to the program. Castro returned the favor. He decorated Yanukovych with the Jose Marti order. And I find this very interesting, but in particular, I find it interesting because as I learned that past summer, the children of Chernobyl program was not Cuba's only experience with Soviet nuclear power. As some of you may know, since 1976, the Soviet Union had been providing Cuba with technical assistance for the construction of two nuclear reactors in Juragua, near the Cuban city of Cienfuegos. And you can't actually go to the reactor now, but I have visited um, the area and it's really fascinating to see. I highly recommend next time you're in Cuba to take a visit. Work on the first reactor began in 1983 and it accelerated very quickly. Soon it was dubbed La Obra del Siglo, the project of the century. An entire city called La Ciudad Nuclear, the nuclear city was built around this project and it was supposed to house all of the engineers who were to work there. And you can actually visit the nuclear city. It's somewhat abandoned, but many people still live there. Now, Chernobyl damaged the credibility of nuclear energy worldwide, but not in Cuba. In the late 1980s, construction on the plant slowed. There were persistent delays. When the USSR collapsed in 91, financing dried up. And in 1992, Castro announced a, quote, temporary halt to the construction of the plant. And then in 2000, he and Putin decided to officially abandon it. But while the plant did close, this appears to be not a product of the financing not a product of the anxiety within Cuba about the future of nuclear power after Chernobyl, but rather a product of the financial circumstances surrounding the fall of the USSR. Basically, there was no money. Um, and so this, all of this research that I did was based on an analysis I did of newspaper articles that were published in Granma. I used an index um, that I found from the University of Texas to collect all of the articles that mentioned Chernobyl the Ch Children of Chernobyl program and the Juragua plant between 1983 when work on the plant started and 92 when work on the plant ended. And I found that coverage of the Children Chernobyl of Chernobyl project was extensive. Of the 25 articles published between 1990 when it started and 1992 when I finished my analysis, 48% were on the front page of the newspaper and 76% were above the fold. But um, although the accident itself, what happened, what led to the program was in many cases omitted completely or reduced to a brief sentence. But I argue that by providing such hope, high profile coverage to the program, the Cuban government was implicitly acknowledging the scale of the tragedy. So at first glance, it may seem that Cuba's reaction to the Chernobyl accident was contradictory. At least that's what I thought when I started thinking about this. On the one hand, Chernobyl had a negligible impact on the construction of the Juragua nuclear power plant. On the other hand, by offering to provide free medical treatment to thousands of victims, the Cuban government was clearly signaling that it was aware of the scale of the accident. So I asked myself, if Cuba understood the human consequences of Chernobyl for the USSR, then why did it not proceed more cautiously with the Juragua project? Well, as you may imagine, and as you're probably guessing, I found that really there wasn't a contradiction so much because both of these programs 
served important Cuban goals in terms of maintaining autonomy and in Cu increasing Cuban prestige. So what do I mean by that? Well, by autonomy, I mean that as you are aware, I'm sure, traditional accounts of Soviet Cuban relations portray Cuba as a client state. But of course, Cuba did not see itself this way. Um, while Cuba was indeed subordinate to the USSR for most of the 70s and 80s, it never fully surrendered its autonomy. For example, it supported many liberation movements in Africa, most famously in Angola, of its own accord. In Juragua, Cuba was careful to highlight that its VVER light water reactors were different to the RBMK graphite model that was installed at Chernobyl. Cuba was convinced that its project was safe and that it would not repeat the mistakes of the USSR. It was not a Soviet puppet doomed to the same fate as its master. Likewise, the Children of Chernobyl program was a way for Cuba to put itself on equal footing with the USSR. From the 60s through the 80s, as we all know, Cuba was dependent on Soviet aid. But the Children of Chernobyl program was a way for Cuba to demonstrate that this relationship with the USSR was not one-sided. Additionally, both of these projects contributed significantly to Cuban prestige on a global scale. Juragua was central to Cuban development goals. Even before the revolution, Castro had dreamt of bringing electricity to the island, and nuclear power was a way to do this. It was also a badge of honor and a way to join the prestigious club of nuclear powered nations. So nuclear energy would not only drive industrialization in Cuba, an important development goal, but also improve the island's standing on the world stage. And similarly, the Children of Chernobyl program was an opportunity for Cuba to showcase the crown jewel of its social policy, its healthcare system. And it was also a way to best the United States. Um, after the ceremony marking, marking the opening of the Tarara treatment facility, Castro ridiculed the fact that the, quote, great, immense, and rich country to the north, end quote, offered to take in only 300 children when Cuba was prepared to accept tens of thousands. And so I also want to draw your attention to an interesting contemporary connection, which is this whole question of medical internationalism. Um, as we all know, the story of the Niños de Chernobyl program is part of a larger conversation about Cuban medical internationalism. And in some of the previous panels that I watched earlier this week, um, panelists alluded to the amazing work of Cuban doctors during the pandemic. But there is also debate about whether Cuba should really be directing its scant resources abroad when there are so many challenges, shortages, and necessities unmet at home. And these same questions came up time and again with regard to the Children of Chernobyl program, which, as I mentioned, continued throughout the special period when Cuba really was in dire economic straits. So this paper only scratches the surface of the relationship between Cuba, Ukraine, and nuclear power. As I mentioned, it was a term paper, but I really hope to continue this research, perhaps this upcoming year at Cambridge. Um, in particular, I'd like to conduct research in Ukraine and interview Ukrainians who had been treated in Cuba, because I think this program is fascinating and it hasn't received a lot of attention. Um, I also want to draw your attention to some further questions that I had, which may um, inform my research. For example, what role did the US play in Soviet nu Cuban nuclear cooperation? As I mentioned at the beginning, the US was very opposed to this project of the Cuban nuclear power plant. Um, how did Cuba's thinking about nuclear power change with the fall of the Soviet Union? As I mentioned, this program continued till 2011. And so what role does Chernobyl now play in contemporary Cuban-Ukrainian relations? And finally, how much is this uniquely a Cuban story? What parallels can we draw between the Cuban case and other countries' histories of nuclear power and disaster? I'm thinking, for example, about Japan, which has a very sordid history um, with nuclear energy, but also is a nuclear power and, and has touted nuclear energy as an important way to produce energy. So these are all interesting questions, and I look forward to your advice as well about um, further areas of investigation. So just briefly to wrap up, um, I'd like to sort of use this time to tell everyone to watch the Chernobyl series. It was fascinating, and it really spread like wildfire in Havana past being passed around on people's USB drives. Uh, but at the same time, Cuba has, for the past few years, been reliving its nuclear past on screen. In 2015, the movie La Obra del Siglo was released, which is about the abandoned Ciudad Nuclear. It's very interesting. You can find it on Amazon. 
And in 2018, another film was released, which you may have seen, Un Traductor, which chronicles the story of a Havana, University of Havana professor of Russian literature who translated for some of these visiting Ukrainian children. When I was in Havana last summer, this movie was playing in all of the theaters and it's very interesting. But I just thought it was interesting to see how these two films highlight the strange connection between Cuba and Chernobyl. Um, and I think that they show that it is still relevant today. Um, and they sh show that although this is part of Cuban history, um, the programs, both of the programs still have lessons for Soviet Cuban relations, Cuban national self-perception, and also questions of developing countries' nuclear ambitions. So thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you very much, Isabel. Thank you. Um, before turning over to the discussants, I, I want to take a couple of minutes and share with the students and with the other members of the panel and with all the participants in this panel, which I'm very pleased to have. We have a significant number of participants in the panel. Um, these are words for the students from uh, Carmelo Mesa Lago. I, I don't think I need an introduction. I don't need a bio. I think everybody who knows Cuba in any capacity, in any field, in any discipline is familiar with Carmelo's uh, tremendous contributions to Cuban studies and to the study of the Cuban economy for many, many years. So I'm going to turn over to, since the words, uh, these, are, these are comments for, uh, from Carmelo uh, for the students, and I know all of you are fluent in Spanish. Uh, voy a pasar al castellano, si me lo permiten, eh, y les voy a leer las palabras de Carmelo. For those of you in the, in the, in the audience who may not be fluent in Spanish, um, uh, my apologies, but I will read uh, his words verbatim in, in Spanish. Eh, palabras de Carmelo Mesa Lago. O sea, para ustedes, los estudiantes, las que han expuesto sus trabajos aquí y, y también para los demás participantes en el concurso eh, de ASCII. Ahí, ahí vamos. Por primera vez en este año he sido parte del comité de selección de los trabajos de estudiantes de posgrados presentados a la competencia por el premio de ASCII generosamente establecido por Jorge Pérez López, lo cual considero un gran honor. La lectura y el análisis de los trabajos ha consolidado mi esperanza de que la nueva generación de académicos que trabaja sobre la economía cubana son de altísima calidad, radican en diversos países y se dedican a importantes aspectos del tema, lo cual asegura el futuro del campo. Mi felicitación a todos los contendientes y ojalá que en el 2021, es decir, el 2021, hayan aún más trabajos. Estas son las palabras del distinguido profesor Carmelo Mesa Lago, un gran amigo y colega de todos nosotros para ustedes. Así que felicidades. Now I'm going to switch to the idioma del imperio, <laughs> the <laughs> English, de <laughs> um, <laughs> lengua franca. Sí, sí. Um, the, we have two discussions and I realized after um, looking at my own presentation that I should have asked the discussants for their bio. I know S uh, Professor Silvia Pedraza introduced Professor Enrique Pumar uh, prior to that, and, and he will be our first discussant. He will be commenting on the papers by Denise and Isabel. And then following that, we're gonna have Michael Strauss who will be commenting um, on Adriana's paper. Uh, for the interest of time, I, I, I'm going to ask both of them to be very brief. And then following that, we will have the Q&A session. And then following that, we will have some closing remarks by, by myself, but also some closing remarks by, by our outgoing president of ASCII, uh, Professor Silvia Pedraza. So without further ado, Professor Pumar, uh, we look forward to hearing your comments. We have to unmute you, hang on. Enrique, if you can unmute your phone, your microphone, please. I, I thought I had done it, but can you hear me now? This is, it looks like a, like a cell phone commercial. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> So I, I am I, I'm not making a commercial for anybody. Just just I just 
you know, uh, found it convenient to use the phrase. Um, since this is the last panel of the conference, I'd like to, co to express my gratitude uh, to Sylvia for her leadership uh, the last two years, to Larry and Frank uh, for putting together uh, the conference uh, via Zoom. Uh, this is something that is unprecedented. The first time that ASCII uh, goes uh, fully uh, virtual and perhaps may not be the last. Uh, and um, they deserve a tremendous uh, credit for their vision and their organization. And most of all, of course, uh, my gratitude to Mario for uh, uh, handling the student, uh, lead, uh, leading the student uh, panel and for the work, uh, work well done and also for uh, giving me the pressure to, to participate today and to offer some uh, very humble comments uh, to all of you. Um, I echo what Sylvia said before, which is that um, at ASCII, we all look forward to, to this moment. We all, we all look forward to the panel. And the three presenters today uh, is another testament of why we do that. Uh, the students always present us with very fresh ideas, uh, insightful comments, uh, very well organized papers. Um, with very, very good data, which um, sometimes we cannot collect ourselves because of work responsibilities and so forth. Um, and also uh, with a lot of uh, provocative questions to think about. So I want to thank uh, the three presenters today, um, you know, just to uh, say that uh, this year, like other years have been fantastic and I, I would love uh, for you guys to continue being a member of ASCII and to contribute to, uh, and to, contribute to the organization. Uh, Mario is very humble, but Mario, I first met Mario when he was a student and he presented at the student uh, panel and, and now he's a professor and, and so many other people uh, that we can mention. But uh, Mario is a very good example of of, of the kind of association uh, that we would like to see uh, with you and the type of engagement that we all would like to maintain with all of you. So I hope you could take that seriously. As Mario said, let me, let me go right into my comments. Uh, I, I am responsible for commenting on two papers, the, pa the paper by Denise and the paper by Isabel. Uh, let, first, let me start with the paper by Denise. Uh, the paper by Denise is a very good study of um, how the Cuban community, despite uh, many, many problems in the community and despite many misperceptions, uh, have chosen to engage in Cuba uh, politically and economically, although quite frankly, uh, she doesn't talk too much about politics. Uh, she, talks, she concentrates on, on economics. I, uh, I have a, an anecdote to, to share with you, which I think uh, demonstrates uh, the extent of this engagement. My wife and I, uh, we were sending a care package last December, and we were in Hialeah, and, and the woman that was attending us uh, gets a call, and she, you know, we're right next to her on, on her desk, and she, she speaks with somebody, and then she turns to the, the head of the agency and said, this woman is asking if we can send a rose y frijoles negros for tomorrow to celebrate uh, Nochebuena in Cuba. And my wife and I looked at each other and said, oh my God. Uh, and the, the head of the, the agency said, no, there is no time to send a rose and frijoles negro, but there is time to send a rose frito. And we said, <laughs> okay, wow, this is... If, if there is a sign of transnationalism, this is it. Uh, there is no other variable uh, that, that explains this better than transnationalism. However, uh, I would like to uh, uh, comment that the literature on transnationalism uh, also uh, is a, is a two-way street. And I think that um, although uh, the paper is very well written and highly provocative, I would like to encourage uh, to Denise to look at the way Cubans have influenced 
Cubans from the island have influenced uh, the Cuban community in Miami. Uh, there are many ways to do this. Um, if, we, if we look at sociological theory, um, George, uh, George Simo, so in, in his very famous book, The Philosophy of Money, says that money is simply a, an attribute of symbolism and social relations. And if we use Simo as a point of departure, we can see that the Cubans from the islands have influenced tremendously the community in Miami, uh, both symbolically and in terms of social relations. Uh, in one way to measure this is just to, to look at the fixation of Cubans in Miami with Cuba in the island. I, I am always amazed that during this time uh, when our, our country, and by that I mean the United States, is undergoing one of the most uh, decisive uh, political elections, Cubans in Miami are still judging candidates based on their position on Cuba. <laughs> Uh, if that is not an influence of Cuba, Cuban in the island, on Cuban in Miami, I don't know what it is. And the, with regard to social relations, I would encourage Denise to ask uh, Cubans in Miami, how much sacrifice mm -hmm. do they have to put up to send remittances to Cuba? Money is not elastic. Uh, there is all, there, money is zero sum especially when you live with a fixed income like most people in Miami do. I know many people in Miami that do not send the, the kids to FIU, even though FIU is dirt cheap. Uh, they don't send the kids to FIU because they don't have money because they send money to Cuba all the time. Instead, the kids go to Miami Dade or another, or, or they, they simply wait for a free ride from the Florida State to the amazement of those of us who pay taxes in the state. So I think it is very important that we uh, look at the both ways relationship of transnationalism. Two other questions very quickly before I, I, I switch gears to, the, to Isabel. It is always very important, in my, in my opinion, uh, to understand why transnationalism happens. Um, I think that this is a very, very, it looks like a very easy question, but it's actually very complicated. Um, again, I love sociological theory, so I would say, in my opinion, one good uh, head start to answer this question is to look at Durkheim dynamic density. I think that he offers some very insightful comments here as to why this happens. But it is very important to understand, uh, uh, you know, why, um, uh, why transnationalism happens, because that tells us something about the literature of transnationalism itself. I think that most people who study transnationalism are so preoccupied with documenting the degree of trans, of, of, of relations between two communities that they forget that transnationalism is often a condition of political and economic reasons beyond the communities that are engaged in transnational relations. A very good example is the recent decision by President Trump, or by Trump, uh, not my president, by Trump, uh, who uh, denied all flights to Cuba. That seems to me that it's gonna stop a, a little bit of the transnationalism. My friend Nikki, who has a girlfriend in Miami, is not gonna be able to see, I mean, in, in Havana, is not gonna be able to fly to see her. He's actually getting a refund on, the, on, on his tickets uh, for, that he had scheduled to fly to, to Havana. So, I would, I, I would encourage Denise to think a little bit about how transnationalism relates to the political and economic climate of the countries and how that influences uh, transnationalism uh, or the dynamics of transnationalism. Uh, finally, um, before I jump uh, to Isabel, let me, let me mention that it is very important too 
that uh, when we look at, at transnational relations, um, we, um, we, we pay particular attention as to uh, why this is happened. I mean, not, not just why transnationalism occurred, but why it manifests itself differently in different generations. Uh, Denise uh, alluded to that, and I agree that not everybody reacts to QR in the same way. By the way, this is not unique to, to Cubans. I've done some research in Central Americans in Washington, D.C., and the young Central Americans react very different from, the, from their parents in terms of remittances and contacts with family and so forth. So this is a very fascinating question. Great paper, a lot to think about, much more uh, if you uh, assume, decide to, to, to look at some of my suggestions and some of these questions for further research. Now let me uh, address uh, Isabel's um, a paper, a paper. Isabel's paper is fantastic. Uh, I love uh, the archival research that, that you on the, uh, took. Uh, I commend you for um, the depth of your, of your, of your research. Um, I, I, as a college professor, I cannot imagine someone like you doing research in three countries for a term paper. Imagine for, the, for your dissertation. <laughs> this is gonna be amazing. Um, you know, but uh, so, so there's a lot, of, a lot of very good things about the paper, but of, obviously uh, in academia, um, you know, having, receiving comments is actually very good. I was at once told that if you don't, if you present a, a paper and no one gives you comment, it's because they didn't like the paper. So the fact that I'm gonna comment on, on some uh, research is because I like your paper very much. Um, I think that you present a very good question, which is uh, why Cuba provided medical assistance and uh, didn't make a big deal about their own uh, nuclear plant. And, and you talk about, uh, you try to solve, solve that uh, paradox by saying, well, Cuba is not a, a client of the Soviet Union, or at least they don't see themselves as such. Uh, my reaction to that is that very few clients see themselves as clients. And, I think that in order to understand uh, the dynamic of clientel relations between Cuba and the Soviet Union, we need to go back to the 1960s. In the 1960s, two events happened that are very relevant to your research, Isabel. The first is that at the end of the Cuban Missile Crisis, Castro got, was really, really upset because when the Cubans, I mean, when the Soviet negotiated with the United States, they left him off the bargaining table. In fact, he was so upset that he uh, became almost belligerent. Uh, and the relations between the Soviet Union and Cuba cooled off for a little bit. When they were about to warm up again, the uh, Czech, the Prague uprising occurred in 1968 and Castro uh, went on grandma and applauded the uprising first. But then immediately something unprecedented happened. The Soviet Union put an embargo on Cuba. Those of us who were living in Cuba in 1968, we were embargoed by three countries, by the United States, by, by the Soviet Union because um, Castro didn't agree with them, the Brezhnev Doctrine, and by the Chinese because there was a dispute about that Cuba was not paying for some rice that had consumed for the, for, for the Chinese. And Mao was very idealistic, but not when it came to money. When it came to money, you had to pay him. So um, this lasted for about a week, and then Castro gave back, gave back you know, took back his position and defended the Brezhnev doctrine, reverse itself. And I think that this defined the clientel relation between the Soviet Union and the United States. And the client relation as I see it is as follows. Um, one is, one type of clientel relation is what I would call a hegemonic dependency in which as you pointed out in your paper, 
the, the master basically tells uh, the client what to do. This was not the case as a result of the 1960s. The Soviet and the Cuban understood that Castro was too proud. And because of that, there has to be, the, the relation was complicated. There had to be a little bit of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of freedom for Castro to maneuver. So there is a less hegemonic clientele relationship that occurs here in my personal opinion. And that clientele relation is one in which Fidel knows what the boundaries are. The boundaries are, you don't criticize the Soviet Union. And he demonstrated that in the non-aligned uh, meetings when he pro openly said that the Soviet Union was the natural ally of the third world. Imagine that. So I, I think that um, history is important and um, it's important for how decision makers behave. Let me conclude because I know my time is up by saying that um, I have obviously many questions for and suggestions for, for, for the paper. One is uh, I would look at the sociological literature on client-time relationship to understand uh, this relationship since, since it is such an important part of your paper. I would also encourage you to, to situate your, your research in the uh, international relation uh, literature uh, uh, on, or theory. This brings my last point, which is that in international relations, there are at least two levels of analysis. Uh, you have the realist position, which assumes that the nation state has consistent principles and norms and interests. And you have the decision-making approach in which he says that the interests of the nation state are defined by the leaders who make decisions. So this brings me to my last question. What can we learn from your paper for Diaz-Canel? Is, is, the, is the lessons for your paper a decision-making, are you some assuming a decision-making approach where you basically telling us how Castro behaved and Castro follow a very predictable, predictable pattern when it came to crisis, which you demonstrate in your paper, by the way. Or is this more the realist position that part of the Q1 creed is to react in certain ways to crisis? And, 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 and if that is the case, what would, what would the current leadership no Castro leadership would do. I think this is absolutely very important uh, to understand the, the current uh, situation in Cuba. Thank you both. Thank you for the opportunity to offer some comments. Thank you, uh, Enrique. Now we're gonna move on to Michael Strauss who will share his comments uh, about Adriana's uh, paper. Michael, please go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mario, and, and thank you, Adriana. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Isabel and Denise because I found all three papers really quite interesting. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the places I teach is at the uh, Belarusian State University, and they have a new nuclear plant that's going to go into service next year. Uh, I had a chance to visit that. And the message was, don't worry about a thing. Uh, they also said, no smoking and don't push any buttons. Uh, in any case, uh, thank you very much, all three of you, for uh, such excellent and interesting papers. And interesting really is the word that I want to emphasize. Uh, Adriana's paper, I found to have very good organization, methodology, writing, uh, it was uh, uh, a very clear exposition of the subject, and the subject itself is interesting and vital uh, for all sorts of different socioeconomic reasons. Uh, and I, uh, it's one of these papers that was a joy to read. You know, you get every now and then uh, uh, a paper there where you read it and you read it again and you think, wow, this is how it should be done. It doesn't get better than this. 
Uh, and uh, I wish some of my students will, will uh, be tempted to show it to some of my students, even though they uh, study other things. Uh, in any case, uh, rather than, than dwell on comments because I just more or less summarized them, and because time is limited, I wanted to uh, do something that uh, papers that I really like inspire me to, uh, uh, to do, and that is uh, uh, something you mentioned as well, uh, Adriana, which is, you know, where do you go from here? What other subjects of uh, inquiry does this research uh, lead to? Can it lead to? Uh, and uh, uh, I find that some of the best research provokes new questions. Uh, and uh, so I wanted to share some of these questions with you. And if there's time to answer any of them, uh, uh, if, you, if you have a sense of them, but if not, uh, it may be uh, uh, roots for future, future uh, research projects. Uh, one question I had was, uh, okay, the uh, remittances increase the resources available for people in Cuba to engage in political protests. I don't know what, I don't know what, uh, 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 you know, how the resources are used, whether it's direct or indirect, whether that's even measurable, but does this become a certain, to a certain extent, uh, discretionary income? Uh, if it's not used for necessities? Uh, and to what extent does this, you know, improve their lives in other ways besides allowing them to, to engage in greater political activity? Uh, are the people who receive the remittances cognizant of the relationship? Uh, in a more general sense between uh, the fact that, okay, they have some money, we can now get more involved in political uh, uh, protest or some other political uh, activity. Are they, are, are they cognizant of it at the personal level with their own remittances, but also uh, in a more general sense and, and what the potential might be? Uh, also, to what extent is the Cuban government cognizant of this relationship? Because that can play into policies uh, they enact both with regard to, uh, uh, well, the, it can play into policies both with regard to what the Cuban government does and what the United States government does. Uh, limiting remittances to Cuba, for example, uh, which the US has done, is that uh, uh, a policy that takes into account the kinds of research that you do? Uh, so uh, these are very, very interesting questions to me. I don't know what the answers are. Uh, it may be that you will in a couple of years if you pr pursue this path. Uh, and the other question uh, uh, that this raised was uh, the general question is, to what extent might the remittances be made with the purpose of indirectly or encouraging protest if the remitters themselves are also aware of this. And that awareness is something that I have no idea of. My guess is that most of them don't think about it, but I don't know. Uh, I haven't seen any research that discusses that. Uh, another area, another, uh, range of questions comes about uh, because, uh, you know, there have been a lot of studies that show that uh, socioeconomic status is, there is a correlation between socioeconomic status and uh, the, uh, uh, the engagement of individuals in political activity. Uh, uh, almost like it's a kind of, uh, I'm oversimplifying, but it's kind of a luxury activity. Uh, the better off you are, the more you can do, and the more time you have to do it. Uh, and uh, uh, I think, uh, yeah, it was William Erb 
if I'm pronouncing that correctly, who wrote 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, uh, I'll just read the sentence because it really sums it up. Whether the, uh, is it, uh, uh, the higher the social status, the more likely to register, to vote, to be interested in politics, to discuss politics, to belong to politically relevant organizations and to attempt to influence the political views of others. Uh, and that's pretty much held true in other studies uh, uh, on this subject. Now, uh, it raises the interesting question about the remitters because they are in a way voluntarily reducing their economic well-being for themselves in order to provide money to family, whatever, in Cuba. Uh, what does this do to their engagement in politics? Uh, does this have a diminishing impact, for example, on uh, the political activity of Cuban Americans uh, in any kind of way that might be measured? Uh, and uh, so these are, you know, some of the questions uh, that arise. Uh, do they, do they uh, you know, not consciously perhaps reduce their socio-political engagement in the United States? Uh, and might they have, along with their remittances, some sort of socio-political engagement themselves uh, with in Cuba with the uh, funds that they remit. Uh, uh, so these are all, to me, interesting questions. All of them are things that came out of reading your paper, uh, which is what I like about doing this kind of exercise. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, I hope that you are uh, uh, able and interested enough to pursue some of these. If you have any ideas uh, uh, of, of what some of the answers might be, if there's any time left this evening, I'd love to know. But uh, uh, anyway, I'll leave my comments there because we are limited in time. Right. Thank yes, you again. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you, Michael. So what i like to do now is go on to the Q&A session, read a couple of questions. Um, there was a question from Roger Betancourt and the question pertains to the, it, it looks like it's directed to Adriana's paper or Adriana's pr uh, presentation. So his question, I'm gonna paraphrase it, is the role of government. So I guess is what, what is the role of government repressive actions in affecting protests? So that question, I'm going to also look at uh, or, or consolidate some other questions that are here from the Q&A uh, so, so let me, let's do a block of three questions, maybe another block, and then I'm going to turn it over to Sylvia, who will uh, close uh, with, you know, with her closing remarks. And there are a couple of questions from John Suarez, and I think the, the, the main question here is, um, was the expansion of, he's talking about the expansion of the military's control over the Cuban economy, uh, and under the detente, uh, on, during the Obama uh, era, you know, the normalization de las relaciones and all that. So, so he's, he's contextualizing this question in terms of did, did really the detente achieve what we believe that it would achieve because the, the Cuban military gained their, uh, expanded their control on the Cuban economy. We can see that actually in recent uh, in recent months uh, with uh, re-dollarization. And then I'm going to, uh, I, I was gonna type my own question, but I have a very quick question and a comment, and then I'll, uh, I'll allow you guys to respond. So Denise, I think you uh, presented a slide with Malmierka and the law, foreign investment law 118. And it was paraphrasing something to the effect that there, there are no limitations on investments by Cubans residing abroad. But my question is, you know, recently the Cuban government, MinRex has announced that um, even Cubans who are in the island, los cuentapropistas, who want to export and import, you know, they'll be allowed to export and import, but 
those activities have to be done through a state-run intermediary. And we know how effective, or I'm saying that sarcastically, these state-run intermediaries have been over the last 60 years. So you mentioned in one of your policy recommendations to allow greater participation by the Cuban diaspora, but it seems to me that it's moving the other way when the government persists that the state must control the export and import business. My other very quick um, comment for Isabel was about Angola. It's very personal because I lost family in Angola. And um, Cuba, I disagree. Cuba did not participate on its own accord in Angola. Cuba was fighting a colonial war and it lost something like 10,000 Cubans in Angola. And the Soviet Union supplied Cuba with equipment, military advice, training, strategic advice, new weapons and all that. And um, so the, my, my comment is just that, that it, it, I know it presented everywhere that Cuba was, you know, representing the third world. It was, this was a liberation struggle, but it wasn't. It was Cuba participating as a client state for the Soviet Union, sacrificing blood for treasure. So that was, that was just my comment. And uh, I, let me just take a quick look at the Q&A. I hope I didn't miss anything else, but yeah, those are the only questions. So if, um, please uh, feel free to go ahead and respond. Thanks, Mario. I can start. Um, yeah. I think just to make sure I got the question done right, it was uh, around the role of the government in repressing protest. Yes. Great, thanks. Um, so I think that this is really interesting and um, definitely complicated some of the relationships I was trying to look at because in Cuba, protests are banned in such a way that often some of the activity is much more subtle than it would be in, in other countries, right? And so I think that you know, without necessarily like having signs or picketing that there are still protest activities happening. And that, that just introduces another element of how do we measure protest and how do we um, capture some of these activities. And I think that one area that's really interesting is actually the private sector. That that's where we are seeing um, some, you know, different variants of protest happening. Um, and I think that it's a great point to raise and something that should be, you know, perhaps incorporated in, in when we think about protest, what it, what it really means and different ways to measure that. Um, thanks. Thanks. Uh, I go? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much for, for the questions and also for the uh, comments. Um, I really appreciate Carmelo Mesalago uh, comments uh, to our papers. That's a great encouragement. Uh, for the question about the military control, I'm not sure if there has been an expansion of the military control. I think Cuba has been a centralized state and military has been over there uh, since the time of the revolution. So I'm not pretty sure about the expansion. I'm sure they have been there. And, uh, and for this new um, opportunity for private entrepreneurs to import and export, this is something that's still to be seen. Uh, there is uh, a meeting that is going to happen in October, and I'm very looking forward to uh, what specifications and uh, they will say about that. And my recommendation, of course, is like to integrate more both uh, the private entrepreneurs with their own power and their own active participation, but also the key one diaspora to that process. So far, it doesn't look to me that it's going to that way, especially for the key one diaspora. They have been invited to participate in the process of uh, economic change on the island, but, but only through the uh, company of the state, not by their own or only with the private entrepreneur. So, but that's my recommendation. And I will also uh, want to, to thank uh, Pumar for the comments and also to uh, share some ideas here. I agree uh, with Professor Pumar that it's important to see the transnationalism to the other way, so how uh, things that happen in Cuba, the policies in Cuba influence how the Cuban diaspora react or what's their position. But also uh, what's happened here, like uh, Pumar has said that Cubans in Miami are evaluating the candidates based on their position towards Cuba. And I see that's totally 
uh, evident right now with the limitation of travels to Cuba, that policy seems to me really cosmetic and focus on the, uh, uh, you know, to gain votes from Florida, especially right now that Cuba has crossed, like the borders have been closed again due to the COVID situation. So if you limited the trips again to Cuba, I don't think that is going to affect that much because there is not a lot of people traveling to Cuba now. Uh, it should be a right, right? But uh, I think it's more cosmetic and more like to gain some votes in among the, the Cuban American uh, population in South Florida. Thank you. All right. So um, I turn it over to our current president, outgoing president, Sylvia. Pedraza, Professor Silvia Pedraza, who will make the closing remarks. My many thanks for all of you for participating, to the audience for remaining with us. I know we're over time, we're kind of in a bind here for time. And it is a pleasure to have all of you in the panel. Without further ado, Silvia, please, your closing remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, I just don't want to leave without thanking all the people who worked with me the last two years. They were two years filled with crises crises of different sort, but crises. And very often I felt like I think that people uh, express it in Cuba when they, you ask them, how are you doing? And they say, estoy asfixiado. You know, I'm, I am without, <laughs> uh, unable to breathe. And then they say, so how are you dealing with the situation? Oh, I am resolviendo, I am inventando. And I think in ASCII, we had to spend the last two years feeling asfixiados and then resolviendo and inventando. But I, but I think that we did it. And I think that this uh, you know, virtual conference is a very good expression of the fact that we came out, as I think one often has to come out, you know, uh, ahead of where we had been in the past. So I just wanna thank everybody. I wanna thank especially the conference panelists, and I will only say first names because by now we all know each other. But when I look at the cast of characters in this conference, it's actually amazing because you would expect, of course, a number of Cuban Americans. This is a Cuban American, American Association and it was founded by Cuban Americans. Um, but, um, but there's also a number of people who were Cubans in the island. There was a Cubano Espanol, there was a Cubano Colombiano, there was a Cubano Puerto Riqueño, and there was a Russian with an American heart and, 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 a, and Americans with a Cuban heart, and a Russian with a Cuban heart. So it's an amazing uh, bringing together of people uh, who have collaborated very well in this video teleconference that has allowed us to bridge over very wide separations in geography uh, and do something together. I do, however, hope that the next conference will be presencial, face-to-face, because it would be awfully nice, as one usually does in a conference, if you can go out to lunch with some of your friends, if you can click a drink at a, the cocktail, you know, if you can have a little bit more of a presence, un abrazo, un cariño. Uh, so we have done what we could with a video teleconference and have risen to the occasion. But I do hope that we get to see each other again at a face-to-face -face conference and that hopefully that conference will be at FIU January 4th through 6th, 2021. You know, stay tuned through our website, ASCIIcuba.org. And I want to especially thank the people who made the virtual conference, the technical aspects of it in particular possible. And without doubt, that is first and foremost, Larry, Kata Baker, Frank Carlos Martinez, Mike Periu, our website master, and Jorge Perez Lopez. And the people who worked with me in the last couple of years, our treasurer has been incredibly important. I mean, she keeps us solvent and she keeps us afloat, Silvia Villalon Nielsen. And my board was a very good board, okay? Within the board, we had subcommittees. And in particular, the finance subcommittee worked very well together and will continue, I think, to work together uh, with me and with Gary together. And that involved Jose Ramon de la Torre, Luis Luis, our treasurer, Silvia Villalón Nielsen, and myself. The board at large, in addition, also included Mario Gonzalez Corso, Manolo Villalón, Michael Strauss, Roger de la Torre, Carlos Segle, Cici Rodriguez, 
all of these people were very important in the difficult process of decision making that we had to engage in over the course of two years. In addition, uh, ASCII has survived and thrived for 30 years. This is its 30th year because it has a lot of people who volunteer, who take on different roles within the association and do them very well. One of those is Roger Betancourt, who handled our elections uh, at a time when we couldn't put you know, uh, mail ballots in the mail because of the COVID. <laughs> and we didn't know what we were gonna do with the elections, but we did it. Uh, Joaquin Pujol, who does our ASCII news clippings, a number of people who work in the hosting committee, uh, such as Maria Werlau, Ted Henken, Jorge Dominguez, Carmelo Mesalago. We have a lot of people who have worked in a number of different ways to keep ASCII moving forward as a volunteer organization with a few resources, but a lot of heart and a lot of effort. And last but not least, we also had some very good institutions that helped us and supported us. For example, at FIU, at Florida International University, we're still hoping to have our next conference there. We should have had this August conference there. At the Cuban Research Inst Institute with Jorge Duani and his administrative assistant, Amy Correa. Amy has been incredibly good at you know, sending messages around to everybody. And that was one reason that we got so many more students this year who, um, you know, uh, were able to submit their papers uh, because of the wonderful job that she does announcing this. Dean John Stack has been incredibly supportive of our ASCII e efforts. Aixa Citron of the management of what we hope will still be the physical conference. And then Casa Cuba with Maria Carla Chicoen and her administrative assistant, Maite Morales. Casa Cuba also reached out to help us to announce it broadly. And we have their support uh, without a shade of doubt. At Harvard, Cuban Studies also stepped forward to help us announcing the conference. And so that was the work of Alejandro de la Fuente and Jimena Codina. Um, and so we've had a lot of people really who, you know, uh, helped us at a different uh, moments uh, to make this virtual conference and the work of ASCII more generally uh, possible. Uh, we hope to see you in January 2021 at FIU. And if we don't see you at a physical conference, we will probably see you at the second virtual conference <laughs> of ASCII uh, in next January. But thank you very much. Thank you to the students for their papers. They were all three wonderful. You are the future of Cuban studies. So I'm very pleased to see your papers and thank you to everyone. And now Larry Kata Baker is going to introduce our next president who is Gary May Bartuk, uh, who will certainly have all of my uh, support and help. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and we really appreciate the last two years of work. Um, but you all are not here to hear me. You all are here to hear Sylvia first. And now it gives me extraordinarily great pleasure to introduce the incoming president, Gary Maberdu, who's a PhD economist, retired Foreign Service officer, and a member of our board. He's been writing on the Cuban economy since 1999 when he was counselor for economic and political affairs in the U.S. interest section in Havana. Uh, his work in Cuba has been extraordinary. The amount of insights that he has been able both to gather at the time and then to cultivate uh, over the course of the last several years is just extraordinary. He brings great insight uh, to the organization and is to its directions. And without further ado, uh, Gary, welcome and congratulations. Thank you very much, Larry. Um, I had a whole bunch of, of uh, thank yous to give, but I think Sylvia's pretty much covered them all. But I still would like to make a few thank yous, especially to Sylvia, um, who has guided ASCII through two challenging years. Public and academic interest in Cuba has waned in recent years and ASCII's membership has suffered as well. Sylvia has led the board in finding ways to cut our expenses and been very energetic and successful encouraging donations from our members. With finding membership and rising prices from the Hilton Hotel, 
Sylvie has forged an alliance between ASCII and the Cuban Research Institute at the Florida International University, Unity, where we will hold our next in-person conference, be it in January or Mike, most likely next August. That was not an easy decision for either for herself, but she pushed it through. And I believe it will become a part of ASCII's long-term future. My internet's become unstable. I may end up having to change a platform, so we'll, we'll bear through it. This conference would not have been possible without the help of Larry Katak Baca, Jorge Perez Lopez, and Frank Martinez. Along with the other members of the virtual committee, Larry provided the inspiration for the virtual setting. Jorge, along with Larry and many of the board members, put together the agenda and selected the participants. Those choices were difficult. The selection committee was narrowed and broadened by internet availability. We tried to choose panels with the most widespread appeal. And although I know that many of our members would have done just as well, these year's panels did an excellent job. Even after working in Cuba for 23 years, I was amazed at what I learned these past three days. So thank you to you all. Frank Martinez guided us through the Zoom process, including the practice sessions. We had very smart and wise panelists. But quite a few of us are old codgers who needed support for the newfangled social networking. Frank gave it to us and did it with many long hours. The panelists themselves also worked hard and not just on their paper. I think they enjoyed the camar camaraderie of the practice sessions and the new skills they've learned. Behind the scenes was Mike Carew, our webmaster. Mike is leading for new pastures and it's going to be difficult and expensive to replace. Thank you, Mike, for all your service. Looking ahead, we are facing a lot of challenges. We will first require a decision as to whether to hold a virtual or in-person meeting in, in early January. The board has given the COVID in-person conference. That, however, is the decision of the board, who will discuss it at our September meeting. Please watch for an announcement. Regardless of that decision, I believe there is general agreement that times have changed and ASCII can reach more people if we hold more webinars or Zoom forums. Several interview groups Second. Okay. Okay. What happened? <laughs> uh, more webinars or Zoom forums. Several interviews with ASC, prominent ASCII members are in the planning stage. An interview with Carmen Reinhardt, the economist, Harvard economist and chief World Bank economist, who wrote about the U.S. financial crisis after the Great Recession, uh, will also be interviewed. That will take in place in August, probably around the 26th. So again, pay attention. Keep, keep in track. It'll be on our website. Reinhardt will discuss your views on the possibility of a long recovery after the COVID pandemic. This will be Reinhardt's second visit to ASCII and demonstrates the serious respect ASCII has gained among prominent economists. With the continued deterioration of the Cuban economy and of the possible possibility of a new administration next year, I hope we will have several webinar events to stimulate serious discussion. I would also like to introduce, introduce a series of informal economic roundtables on events in Cuba with varying members and other Cuban observers. Whether called This Month in Havana or Havana Monthly, I hope this will bring, the greater bring greater community participation 
by all ASCII members. When I was first nominated for this job, I was seriously com contemplating trying to start a speaker program, advertising it on our, our website and hoping that make, making our members available to, to uh, events around the US. We may still do that. It may be Zoom for a while, but we'll be discussing that in the board. All of these activities will require greater participation from ASCII members. That's you. The board cannot and should not do it all. I'll be asking for volunteers as the year goes on, but do not wait if you want to help. Just let us know of your interest. I guarantee you, we'll grab you. The agenda will force us to look for greater funding. In the past, our annual meeting has been self-financed. We do not want to put our virtual activities under a paywall, but they will increase our operating expenses. We badly need to upgrade our website. We need further help in the technical side of our virtual events. I would like to do some carefully targeted advertising as we currently do in the Havana Times to attract more members and viewers. This will not be cheap. So if you have not yet paid your 2020 membership or are new to ASCII, please open your checkbooks and join up. I promise you it will pay off for everyone, including yourself. One more item. If you're interested in preparing a paper for the January meeting, the new deadline is September 30th. Information on how to submit papers is on our website. We're going to see a new and updated ASCII in the next two years. I'm looking forward to it, and I'm looking forward to working with all of you. So thank you. Thank you for coming. And um, I don't know if there are any questions, and if they're not, I'm not going to encourage them because we'll yeah, they're not. Okay. Um, so anyway, thank you. And I guess, Larry, this ends our session. This ends our session. This ends our conference. And again, thank you to all the participants. Uh, thank you especially to this last and just brilliant panel of student presentations, um, which I am just delighted to have been a part of, along with the other panels. Um, for those of you who are ASCII members, the videos of the uh, panels will be available uh, so at some point soon. So if you want to see the videos, please consider joining ASCII. Um, and hopefully at a much later date, they may be uh, more freely distributed. And again, thank you all. And with that, the conference has come to an end and we will see you for the next one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye, thank you.